7. We kill everybody, my dear, some with bullets, some with words, and everybody with our deeds. We drive people into their graves and neither see it nor feel it. Maxime Gorky Melody Which one, ma'am? Adriana held up two teal dresses for me to wear for my first day with the bloody Irish clan, but I really didn't care what I wore as long as I got through the damn day. Dr. Anderson, what do you think? I asked the older man, bandaging my wrist. Dr. Anderson was the only doctor I trusted enough to touch me. After all, he was the one who had delivered me, and he had seen more than enough of my injuries to no longer even bother asking. He looked up, pushing his thick glasses up his nose before finishing his work on my wrist. The long-sleeved one would be the best to hide your wound. It won't hide the one on your ankle, but that one is not as bad as your wrist. He was right. I had used so much force to pull the plastic arm off the chair that it had cut deeply into my wrist. The idiot had made his cuffs with reinforced steel, which made it easy to break the chair, but it still hurt like a bitch and it would scar. Adriana looked at me, waiting. White heels, ma'am? I nodded, rubbing my wrist once the doctor let go. I had to fight the urge to throw this damn ugly ring down the drain every time I looked at my hand. Fidel held the door open for Dr. Anderson, but not before handing him an envelope with more than enough money to make sure he wouldn't have to work for a while. Ma'am, after the announcement of your and Mr. Callahan's wedding this morning, I have a few magazines, uh, charities, interviewers looking to have a moment with you. Fidel told me with a phone in his hands. After rising from my chair, Adriana handed me the dress as I walked behind the screen. Fidel, do I look like Martha fucking Stewart? No, ma'am. I would never think you would be foolish enough to end up in jail. He cleared his throat and I laughed. Stepping out from behind the screen, I let Adriana drop the white heels at my feet. Then tell them to go fuck themselves. That would not be wise, mio bambino dolce. My father coughed as he was wheeled in by his nurse. Walking over to him, I kissed him on the cheek. Why can't I tell them to fuck themselves? I asked him as Adriana handed me my bracelets. Because to the rest of the world you are the fiancé to one of the most powerful men in the country, the Prince of Chicago. You aren't the boss to them. They want a Kate Middleton or a First Lady, someone to kiss babies and write big checks on behalf of your fiancé. My father snapped at me, causing me to stop and just stare into his dying eyes. Fidel, Adriana, leave. Within seconds, they, along with my father's nurse, were gone. You're still mad that I shot him. He frowned at me. I do not have time to hold on to anger, and yet here you are, forcing me to waste time disciplining you. Shaking my head, I smiled. You should be proud I didn't kill him. He's a spoiled brat who thinks he was born into the 1920s when women served their husbands and bowed down to their will. I'm not now, nor shall I ever be, any man's arm candy. Melody, he sighed, using my full name like when he was annoyed or pissed. You are as hard-headed as your mother. Thank you. I will take that as a compliment. I turned away from him. It was not one, he hissed. Have you forgotten why you wear the white shoes? My whole body froze for a moment, and a chill ran up my spine. That was a low blow, Orlando. I sneered at him, taking off the damn white shoes before walking into my closet. Most of my things had already been taken out and were en route to Callahan Manor. I had left some of my things I would need in my closet here. One never knows when I would need a personal moment away from the leprechaun. My father wheeled in behind me. I will not go to my grave knowing that this marriage is condemned, and that yet again two people who are made for each other will not swallow their pride. Lower their swords and act as a fucking equals. You, Melody Nietzsche Girani, will not walk the same path your mother and I did. You will support your husband, guide him when needed, and stand by his side and his side alone. You will be a damn Callahan, and you will make sure both families, past and present, rise. He yelled, not once coughing or even so much as blinking, for that matter. Had I closed my eyes, he would have sounded like the Orlando I used to know. What happened with you and Mom is not the same, I replied, slipping on the tan shoes, while in the back of my mind a voice told me to change back. What the outcome will be if you do not take my advice? Make peace with him, Melody. 
Remember how long it took me to adjust to you as boss. Prove it to him. Prove it to them all and do it without making your husband the fool so I can rest in peace. The tenseness in his voice dropped before he coughed again, returning to the sick man that he was now. I hated the thought of having to prove myself. I had done that for years, proving to every man we interrogated, every boss I took down, every crackhead with a big mouth, and even with my men. I thought I was done with that phase of my rule. And yet here I was again. Don't think too long about it. We're not all still in our twenties. Orlando smiled at me. And even though he was only a shadow of the man I used to know, that smile always made me smile. Walking behind him, I pulled his wheelchair back before exiting my closet for the last time. Fine, I will try, but if he treats me like a doormat or worse, Martha Stewart, I am shooting him in the other thigh. I was only half joking. That is all I ask, he said as he was wheeled out of my bedroom. Adriana and Fidel's back straightened as they followed us down the hall. Fidel, are the houses finished? I asked him, walking slower than needed, but I was in no rush to get to my destination. Yes, ma'am, they are. Most of our equipment and technology have been moved into the basement, and the men were moved in last night. However, they want to stay away from the Irish for as long as possible. So would I, I muttered. When I had found out whom I was to marry years ago, I had slowly but surely bought, bribed, and taken government-protected lands, just far enough from the Callahan Manor to give my men a place for their families, that was nearer to where I would be staying. The houses were not anything close to Callahan Manor, or my home here, but they were nice common family homes that would typically be found in the suburbs of Chicago. We had started building three years ago, a task I left to Antonio and Fidel to complete. Are you ready? Orlando asked me. My father's right-hand man since he was a teen. Fiorello stood at the door waiting for us to answer before opening. He was the only one, with the exception of a cook and a nurse, who my father wanted to stay with him here. Fiorello had been tortured by the Valero once upon a time for dirt on my father, which left him with a scar that now graced his face. He fought his way out and came back, asking only for a doctor and a large glass of brandy. I knew my father was going to be fine. I just wasn't sure if I was. Nodding, I signaled for Fiorello to open the door. Beside me, Orlando's nurse took her place at his wheelchair. The moment the door opened, I was met with four pairs of eyes staring at me, each more beautiful than the last, until my gaze fell on Liam, whose green eyes were glued to my legs. His gaze lingered a little on the scar at my ankle before wandering up the rest of my body, meeting mine. His lips were turned in a frown, but his eyes were filled with lust. Ma'am. Monty walked over to me, handing me an iPad. He must have put all the information on Ryan Ross here. I took it from him before walking toward my new familia or Teglach, as it was called in Irish. Good morning. Am I late? I asked as kindly and brightly as possible. No, ma'am. Just thinking you're beautiful this morning, Declan replied as he tried to take my hand and kiss it. I pulled back. His cousin did not seem to get it, because Neil opened his arms as if he were about to give me a hug. Save your fancy words. She looks fucking hot. Simple. Let me make this clear to the both of you. Touch me, and I will strap you down and then take every last bone out of your bodies. Understood? I asked them, with a smile. Neil's arms dropped, and Declan kept his hands in his pocket. Beautiful. I added, Stupid Irish brute. Fidel hissed lowly in Italian. Senza respeto, Monty said softly. He was all about respect. Enough, you fools. We're going to be late. Your mother says it's mayhem outside the manor. Let's go, Cedric told them before winking at me. The old pervert. They walked toward their cars, leaving me alone with Liam and his brand new black Audi. He said nothing, opening the door for me and then closing it when I took a seat. He didn't say anything when he took his seat beside me, either, and I didn't need him to. In fact, I had work to do. According to the files on my tablet, Amory Valero had gotten out of prison, a secret the Valero were trying to hide from the world until they released the savage for their own personal use. Apparently, from what Ryan spilled to Monty and Fidel, they wanted Amory in Brazil to attempt to steal my fucking cocaine. They must have been on fucking cocaine to think it was going to work. But this is what the Valero did, and it was what they were good at, the fucking thieves. For years they had stolen whatever they could from my family. 
The leader, Amory's father, Vance, was all but run out of Italy by my father. Instead of withering into nothing, however, he resorted to the black market. If it was worth a penny, Vance stole it, flipped it, and bought himself more men. If I could, I would hang him by the balls. What is that? Liam's green eyes narrowed as he tried to read the encrypted files, all while the driver in front pretended not to even be in the car. None of your business, you motherfucking Irish asshole. Work, I replied instead, trying my best not to speak my mind. I knew I needed to listen to Orlando, but the look of anger and disgust in Liam's eyes made me want to shoot him in the dick. He tried to pull himself back. You should relax today. It's a day for family. Thanks, but I'm fine. I smiled. I slept like a fucking baby. Because I got out of the chair that you fucking chained me to like a dog, you bitch-ass motherfucking cock. He glared at that. So did I, in fact. The bed was not what I'm used to, but I'm not one to complain. Unless you don't get what you want, then you just cry like a newborn baby who's had his ass slapped. I smiled again before looking back at the information in front of me. You should know that my mother is not fond of cursing, especially in women. To her, women who have to curse are classless, brainless, and foul. He stretched every word out as I crossed my legs. My beautiful, sexy legs. He could not look away. I grinned. You don't fucking say. Well, damn, ain't that a mother shit fucking bitch? Don't worry, Callahan, I'm not gonna cock it up. In fact, I'm going to try my abso fucking loot best not to curse in front of Mama Callahan. His eyes blazed. Stop the car, he told the driver who stomped on the brakes. Liam grabbed the iPad from my hand and a bottle of brandy. Then he stepped out of the car and poured the brandy all over the poor device before dropping his lighter flame blazing on top of it. It went up so quickly that I could hear the glass cracking. Stepping back into the car, he ran his hands through his hair before adjusting his jacket and tie. Go on, he told the driver. Remember Orlando? A tad bit immature, don't you think? I asked, not bothering to look over for fear that I might smack the shit out of his face. You don't fucking say, he repeated my words. But it was either the tablet or you, and since there are dozens of photographers and reporters all waiting to see a happy couple, I figure killing you wouldn't go over so well. You better hope it burns thoroughly, I said, breathing through my nose. He sighed. Knowing you, love, I wouldn't doubt if it had a self-destruct switch. Do I look like James fucking Bond? I smiled. It was a compliment, and he didn't even know it. He glared, realizing his slip, only a moment later. No, more like a black widow. Even better. I laughed, looking out my window. It did have a self-destruct switch, but he didn't need to know that. Leaning back, I allowed myself to drift, trying to forget about the beautiful asshole beside me and the world he was taking me to. Gone was the underground secret life where no one knew who Melody Giovanni was. Where I could just be Mel, the fucking boss. Gone were my days of absolute freedom. Marriage was a horrible, horrible idea, and I should have said no to my father, but the bastard had locked me into it. I had to think on the bright side. No more wasted money or blood as we try to get our drugs from South America into Miami and then the rest of America. No more wars in the middle of downtown Boston or San Francisco. The amount of money I... We would make now was so fucking ridiculous that it would make Bill fucking Gates shit bricks. When Liam's hand took mine, I jumped, pulling a knife from my thigh before either of us could even blink. He stared at me wide-eyed, then smirked at the large blade in my grip before looking at my thigh. I could see the question perfectly. How the fuck did I have it so well hidden? It's time, he said, nodding out the window to all of the cameras waiting just outside a pair of black iron gates with a C in the center. I hadn't even noticed that we had arrived. And now, all the Callahans and the media were waiting on us. Sliding the hem of my dress up, I slid the knife back into its holster, only to find Liam trying to burn a hole through me with his gaze. I killed the last man who looked at me like that. I said, waiting to see the disgust at my words, but instead I only saw more lust. He was getting excited. And the last thing we needed was that in print. For the love of God, control yourself, Callahan. Your mother, the woman who whipped your ass as a child, is waiting for you. That did it. Troy, not to be a bitch. He snapped as he tapped on the window, signaling the driver to open the door. The moment it did, camera flashes assaulted us. 
Liam pulled me closer to him, his arm around my waist, and I used the opportunity to try to fix his sex hair. He kissed my cheek when I was done, causing reporters to throw as many questions as possible at us. I wanted to flip them off, but Liam squeezed my hand, and I smiled, squeezing back. To them we looked like lovesick fools, if they only knew. A stunningly beautiful woman, who could only be Liam's mother, stepped forward from the clan behind her. Liam, put some room between you and the poor girl. We are Catholic, for goodness sake. She pulled me into a tight hug, and I knew where Neil got it from. These people need to stop touching me. Mrs. Callahan, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Liam could not stop ranting and raving about you, I said as politely as possible. Please, call me Evelyn, my sweetheart. She smiled brighter than the sun. You have no idea how long I've waited to meet you. And no wonder your father hid you away. You're so beautiful, Melody. I dropped my head, for effect, before smiling. Thank you, Mrs. Evelyn. But please, just call me Mel. My name doesn't fit my personality at all. I can't carry a note. She nodded with pleasure as she pulled me forward. From the corner of my eye, I saw the shocked look on Liam's face. Just because I fucking hated the role didn't mean I couldn't play it. He wasn't the only one surprised. Declan and Neil looked at me in confusion before looking at each other to make sure they weren't insane. Cedric just nodded at me with approval, looking a tad bit impressed. Mel, these are my other two daughters. Olivia, Neil's wife. The Malibu Barbie with her long gold hair and bright blue eyes glared at me, but shook my hand, giving it a tight squeeze. Wow, you're so beautiful. I said, smiling. Her eyes lit up like she had found the true meaning of Christmas. Thanks, she said. Next was Caroline, the rather tall, chocolate-skinned woman with a wide smile on her face. Hi, I'm Caroline. I am glad to finally meet you. She couldn't contain herself from pulling me into yet another hug. What the hell was up with these damn people? Oh, my. Italian silk. Very nice. She grinned when she pulled back and said, Oh, my God, and the shoes. There is a walk heel thon for charity on Saturday. You should join me. She wants me to ruin my shoes for charity? Hi, Caroline. I smiled at her. Everyone is so nice. Thank you for welcoming me into your home. You have no idea how nervous I've been. I heard Neil hold back a cough. Caroline grabbed onto my free arm while Olivia just smiled, clearly finding no threat in me whatsoever just like the rest of them. Come, Melody, we'll make sure the rest of the family doesn't overwhelm you too much. Evelyn smiled, leading me to the manor. It was the exact opposite of my home, sadly. Callahan Manor was a modern-day fortress. Beyond the cream marble floors that stretched for as far as the eye could see, the double grand staircases framed with black iron and the engraved French wooden doors, there was nothing but 46,000 square feet of illegal activity. There were no statues, barely any plants, and only modern paintings. Everything was simple, crisp, and clean. I wanted to puke. For eighty-five million, I expected more. I'm sorry. I paused, her words only now catching up to me. The rest of the family? Liam wanted to make sure you weren't overwhelmed by too many new faces at your wedding on Sunday. So he thought it would be best to have you meet everyone now. Olivia smiled. They all smiled as if they were talking about five or ten people. But I knew the Callahan clan considered between ninety to one hundred people their family. My Italian line was almost gone. I didn't deal with that many people anywhere, with the exception of my men. Turning around, Liam was grinning like a fucking cat with a ball of yarn. And I knew then I should have killed him in my basement. He winked, and I was tempted to lose my cool, but I wouldn't give him the pleasure. If they are as welcoming as you all have been, I think I can make it. But please don't leave me completely alone. I really wouldn't want to insult anyone. Coraline smiled, again with the fucking smiles. Mel, your family. We wouldn't throw you to the wolves without giving you a spear. Please give me a fucking spear. I knew whose heart I wanted to throw it through. I allowed them to pull me away farther down the boring halls and out of a set of large French doors, which opened to a large grass lawn, now covered in white tents. At least a hundred people sat, drinking, laughing, and stuffing their faces with food. 
Music roared from an old Irish band staged by the trees, and when I say old, I mean old. With full-length white beards, they played their handcrafted instruments for the crowd. For the love of God. Don't be nervous, Evelyn said. You're young and beautiful. They already love you. And those who don't will have to, because you're Liam's. I'm my fucking own, I wanted to yell at her. And I wasn't nervous. I was pissed. I wanted to play whack-a-mole with all these motherfuckers' heads. But instead, I just smiled and walked outside. Everyone, this is Melody, Liam's fiance. Caroline yelled at the top of her lungs. They all stopped their dancing, singing, and drinking as if they wanted the world to know it wasn't just a fucking Irish stereotype to stare at me. Then they raised their mugs and screamed, Cheers! I don't need this shit. But I had a part to play, so I grinned. Slantha! Everyone shouted with joy. I was motherfucking in with the Irish clan. At least the drunk ones with dicks. The girls would be harder. I could already tell from their glares. Maybe I could tell them they were pretty and try not to hold their faces underwater. Oi, Melody! A group of young kids ran up to me speaking with strong Irish accents. If I hadn't known better, I would have thought that they were drunk as well. But even the Irish couldn't be that crazy. Crouching down to them, I smiled. Gia guich alan lanu. Their grins almost split their faces as they began to speak full-on Irish. Liam must have been following me because he was being congratulated by some other male drunks. He looked surprised that I knew Irish. But he was a chauvinistic pig who thought all I did was paint my toenails and shop. Of course I spoke Irish. My father had me learn the moment that contract was formed. As the children pulled me towards a corner of the massive garden, each dancing around me, I pretended not to notice the women glaring at me. I would speak with them later, but now I needed to make myself look like a fucking saint. I took my shoes off and danced along with the kids, singing their Irish songs and even spinning some of them around. It even made me laugh. Don't get me wrong. I like kids. Kind of, sort of. I was just sure they were annoying as fuck if you spent too much time with them. But I needed them today, so I danced. When I finally stopped, Coraline handed me a glass of water. I wanted wine. My wine. They all love you, Coraline grinned. A few men even cursed Liam for finding you first. Just smile and drink, Mel. Oh, we're going to have a garden party for you tomorrow. For all us girls. Evelyn's eyes shined with joy. Everyone is dying to meet you. I would rather have everyone just dying. I can't wait, I said, but they didn't even notice I was lying. Glancing around, I realized then that all the Callahan men were gone. Where is Liam? I was ready to break the glass in my hands. Olivia and Caroline frowned, but Evelyn held her strong demeanor. She turned her back to the guests to stand in front of me. Melody, don't worry. I know you're aware of what our men do, but believe that they're safe. They often use parties like this one to cover up something else. We try not to get involved and know as little as possible. My son would never want to endanger your well-being. Evelyn's face became serious before relaxing into a carefree smile once again. I nodded, trying my best to stay calm, but as my gaze landed on Fidel and Monty near the doors, looking scared for their lives, I knew someone was going to die tonight. Excuse me. Fidel and Monty stiffened, waiting until I was before them to speak. Flight 735 just exploded over the Atlantic Ocean. Death toll is 192. Eighty-seven of them were Valero, who were smuggling drugs in their seats, Fidel said. The glass shattered in my hand, but I didn't feel it. Even as the blood dripped from my fingers, I couldn't feel it. Walking calmly into the house, I moved straight to the foyer. I had gotten blueprints of the whole place years ago and noticed there was space left out. It didn't take genius to realize they were hiding something behind a fake wall, and that the rather large Jackson Pollock hanging on the faux wall really had to be a door. Bloody hand raised, I waited for Fidel to hand me a gun. We are outnumbered, ma'am, he said instead, and I simply shifted my gaze to him. Today was not the fucking day. Monty handed me the semi-automatic he always had strapped to his leg. 
Fidel, stay out here. I wouldn't want you to get hurt. I snapped before shooting right through the wall. Neither Monty nor I stopped, not even when the painting, tattered and unrecognizable, crumbled to the ground. The wall blew apart bit by fucking bit until the door bounced open. When it released, I stepped in. There stood the rats, all drawn and panicked, with the news playing in the background. My eyes met Declan's, who looked white as a sheet, then Neil, who was trying his best to stop the bleeding in his arm. Next was Cedric, who didn't seem surprised it was me. In fact, he was the only one wearing a bulletproof jacket underneath his suit. If he hadn't been, the bullet hole in his tie would have killed him. The biggest rat of them all, who must have had a fucking guardian angel in his pocket, because he was perfectly fine, was furious. Tell me it wasn't fucking you and you still get to come to the motherfucking wedding, sweetheart. I said, still calm as ever, ready to start shooting again. I should have worn the white heels. Eight. The facts of a person's life will, like murder, come out. Norman Sherry. Liam. Your fiancé is... Neil stopped talking, taking her in through the window as she laughed and danced with the children. A part of me wanted to run over there and save their lives. The beautiful woman with the kind smile, laugh and blushing face, was just an illusion. They were dancing with a fucking lion, a snake in the grass. She is a master of fucking disguise, I hissed angrily. I would have enjoyed watching her dance and smile and sing off key if I hadn't known better. If there wasn't a bullet hole in my fucking thigh, I would have been tempted to think myself lucky. The woman before us now was the woman I was expecting. The one I wanted. And it pissed me off to no end because she didn't exist. This party was supposed to make her uncomfortable, but she was playing every last one of her family like fools. She has them all eaten right out of her hands. She's a master, Neil said, looking at her in wonder and awe. Neil, I will shoot you in front of Olivia and then give her the gun to shoot you again if you don't stop staring at my fiancé like she's the fucking Virgin Mary. I knocked back the brandy in my hand. I hated her for this. For once again making me realise she could play this game. The game of murder and lies. Like a motherfucking pro. Don't take your anger out on me. You're the one who fucked it up. If you had just... Shut the fuck up, Nailer, I swear to God. I gripped the glass in my hand so damn tight it almost broke. Go do your bloody job. I want that plane in ashes in three minutes. He didn't say anything more, instead leaving to meet with Declan along with the rest of our men while I watched my soon-to-be wife walk on fucking water. The moment we had stepped out of the car, she had transformed into this delicate little bird. The melody I met the day before, and the mel she announced herself as to my mother, were two very different women. But she drew them in like moths to the flame. She was so fucking beautiful and non-threatening when she met everyone that for a split second I forgot. Had she been this way when I first met her, I would have dazzled her and charmed her while we were making love on my bed. I would have taken pleasure in making her whole body blush, keeping her safely tucked away. If only my life were that fucking easy. Sir, we're ready. One of my men, Eric Reese, called from behind me. Eric wasn't family, but pretty damn close. He was one of the few of my men with more than half a brain and full loyalty. The rest were in this out of fear, or for the money. Nodding, I walked through the door that led to the secret office my father had built into the walls to make sure no one would accidentally find it. The room was filled with monitors and maps, all focused on where the inbound airplane would be. Are you sure you want to do this, Liam? My father asked as he stared at the dot indicating the plane's current position. It would be crossing into American water soon. It's fucking brilliant, Declan said, waiting excitedly. The Valero will never see it coming. I wish I could see Vance's fucking face, man. Neil grinned. This is going to set him back a fortune. Eric nodded. You should send him a wedding invite, just to sweeten the pot, mate. They were all right, and yet my father still did not seem to approve. Well, fuck him then. 
Vance Valero had no idea anyone knew about his secret plane and had allowed a few unlucky everyday folks to board it. He must have figured no one would be ruthless enough to kill a few innocents to get to his men on board. After today, though, it was going to cause him regret. Not only would he lose men, but he would also lose half a million dollars in cocaine and heroin. That would be a bitch. The moment I saw the plane appear on one of the video monitors, I gave the go-ahead. Do it. Declan smirked, but before he could push the button, Neil beat him to it like they were fucking kids. I'm the fucking oldest cousin, he said before grinning like a mad fool. A moment later, there was red, orange and yellow flames filling the sky. Metal ripped from metal, ashes fell into the sea, and all I could do was revel in the greatness of it all. Sitting back in the chair my father had once claimed, I allowed myself to dream of the future for one moment. The men in the room roared in victory over our accomplishment. The Valero had been fucked by me today. This, plus our wedding announcement, would make it clear that Liam Callahan had arrived, and I planned to make them eat shit for the rest of their lives. I would control the East and the West, and once that was done, all of fucking Europe. Who said you couldn't have it all? Even Melody threw all her bitching and shooting had come in handy. Finding the flight plans was almost too easy. She had been keeping notes on it for months and never did anything. Some fucking boss. She could have cut Vance off at the knees, but instead she did nothing just to save a few people's lives. She didn't understand. We ran the fucking mafia. We spared no one. We took what we wanted, when we wanted it, and we killed to get the job done. All those people were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I would make sure to have my mother, or maybe Melody, open a charity in their names. Right now, I... Before I could even finish my thought, bullets exploded through one of the walls. They pelted us like rain, destroying anything and everything in their way. Fuck! Neil screamed in pain as blood poured from his arm. Open the fucking door and blow the motherfucker away! Declan froze just as a bullet went right past his head and embedded itself into the monitor behind him. My father fell back as a bullet connected with his chest, and Eric held on to his wrist. The rest of the men in the room scrambled to follow orders, but froze when the door opened. Tell me it wasn't fucking you when you still get to come to the motherfucking wedding, sweetheart. Melody screeched, looking me dead in the eyes. Kill her. Put a bullet through her pretty fucking head and toss her off a motherfucking bridge. My mind yelled as I glared down the barrel of my fiancé's semi-automatic. I tried to stay calm. I even prayed for the strength to not lose it, but all I could see was red. Glancing over to Eric, who stood closest to her, he took charge and put a gun to the side of her head, causing her to lower her gun. You little bitch! Have you lost your fucking mind? Carrot Top, she said, still staring into my eyes. You better pull the trigger now. You will regret it if you don't. He glanced at me, but in a split second Melody swung around and used the butt of her gun to bash his face in, knocking him off his feet, and held her gun to his balls. I said you would regret it, she hissed. She pulled back and hammered into his jewels with the butt of her gun. My father frowned, stepping forward as I reached for my gun. There comes a time when enough was fucking enough. Miss Giovanni! I would ask that you not kill anyone in my house. Monty, I believe the man's name was, walked forward, pointing his firearm at Eric as Melody turned to my father, gun held right at his face. Cedric, I like you. I really do, she said, with no emotion in her voice. But step out of the way, or I will kill you before I kill your son. His mother is fond of him, and I am fond of his mother, Miss Giovanni. The motherfucker smiled as though this bitch had not just insulted us, as if she had an almost killed family. Melody, I understand your anger, and you are justified in it. The fuck she is! I shouted, holding my gun up as well. Never in my life did I want to put someone down so fucking badly. Liam Callahan, for the next 48 hours, I still rule! Stand down! Once again, the blood in my veins was demanding blood be spilled, and so I shot right past her head and at Monty's arm. Melody's eyes glowed with rage, but before her bullet could hit me, my father went for her hand. 
He twisted her wrist and struggled with her until the gun was out of her grip and he had her arm behind her back. Melody, listen to me, my father said while she snarled like a damn lion. As the head of the Callahan family, I apologize for my son's idiotic move today and the memories it must have recalled of the damage that was done to you. But I need you to breathe and walk away from this now. Not as a woman, but as a boss, to regroup and think. If you find this room, you must know where Liam's is. He will be there momentarily, and you can speak boss to Kena Canerta. When she nodded, he let her go, and she left with Monty, who held on to his arm, and Fidel, who hadn't moved from the destroyed wall. When she was gone, my father didn't even have to speak. He glared at our guys, and they left faster than she had leaving me with the man who had just spit all over my victory. Once again, all I could see was red, and for the first time in my twenty-four years of life, I wanted my father's blood. You embarrassed me! The relationship, this marriage, it will not work! I will burn the fucking contract so I can put a bullet in her myself! He stepped forward, his eyes darker than a brewing storm. You embarrassed yourself today. Did you not think that a woman... A boss like Melody could have easily bombed the fucking plane. Yes, I know where you got the intel from, you fucking idiot. I checked their files too while you were busy chaining your fiancé to a pool chair. But she didn't do it. She was weak and she didn't want to kill innocents. I snapped back, trying my best not to point a gun in his face. He pointed at the crumbling wall which now exposed us. Did that look like weakness to you? Are you so blinded by the thought of power that you've forgotten everything I've taught you? I sighed deeply, dropping the gun on the table before I pulled the trigger. Everything I did today, you would have done as well. Yes, but I would have made sure it didn't hurt my wife first. Congratulations, you've proven to Vance and his brothers that you're just as merciless as they are. You won the pride of your men, and you pulled off a job no one will tie you to. He snapped angrily. But if you had heeded my words and tried to make peace with Melody instead, you would have used your access to the Giovanni files and did your homework on what happened to Melody and her mother to bring you both together in the first place. I froze, not understanding what Avelia Giovanni had to do with this. She had died years ago. Think about it, then go back to her and grovel. With those words, he left the room. Taking a seat at one of the only computers not blown to the heavens, I pulled up the very files he was bitching about, and my blood froze. March 19. Flight 307 crashes into the Atlantic Ocean. One survivor. Six-year-old Melody Nietzsche Giovanni. Fuck. I murmured to myself as I read the title. But it only got worse. Notes. According to young Melody's memory, there were four men on the plane who stood up mid-flight and started shooting and demanding of Elia Giovanni, wife to the boss, show herself. Mrs. Giovanni, with the help of her bodyguard, placed Melody into one of the overhead compartments right before they were both shot and killed. The men, who were later identified by the V tattoo on their arms, were Valero. After the death of Mrs. Giovanni, they proceeded to kill everyone on the plane. It was due to her tears and whimpering that the men found her. Landing the plane on the surface of the sea, they filled the chambers with smoke before dragging young Melody onto an awaiting boat. Melody explained that, because she was praying, they decided they would let God decide her fate, and threw her back into the ocean, leaving her holding onto a piece of wreckage. As they drove away, they told her that if she survived, to join the Valero when she was older. The boss found his daughter the next morning, clinging onto one of the broken wings of the plane. The plane was torched beyond recognition, and the body of Mrs. Giovanni was never recovered. Melody was alive, but suffered from hypothermia and developed extreme acloophobia, which she has still not recovered from. With therapy, it might lessen with time. Cover up, plane crash due to engine failure. Fuck. I sighed, running my hand through my hair. Fuck, 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 mother of fucking fuck. 
My mind was so messed up I couldn't think straight. All I could see was a younger version of my fiancé clinging to a wing in the middle of the fucking Atlantic Ocean. In the dark. Just how I fucking left her. Fuck. My father was right. I truly needed to grovel. But even that wouldn't change things. It wouldn't be enough. Nothing would be enough. And I had nothing left to give. I had no idea I was even moving until I found myself standing outside my bedroom, dreading the thought of going in. My bedroom was my sanctuary, and now it was going to be the place of my death. But I needed to man up and deal with the consequences of my actions. Inside she stood at the foot of my bed, dressed in all white with a gun and a knife strapped to her side. She seemed to be taking it all in, from the dark reds and gold of my bed and walls, to the wooden floors, large windows, lion-skin rug, piano in the corner, and flat screen plastered on the wall. She turned around slowly, and I really wished I could hear her thoughts. It wasn't a woman-friendly room. However, it wasn't meant to be. We had a machine on board recording their conversations. It's now somewhere in the ocean. A team and I will be getting it back. She told me as she tried to leave the room, but I grabbed hold of her arm first. I can go, I said as she glared up at me. I should go because it's my fault. I'm sorry for everything, I... Look who finally did a background check. If you want to come, I can't stop you. She ripped her arm from my grasp. You are everything I thought you would be. A child in a grown man's body. You are brash and wild, and you don't seem to get the gravity of our situation. You don't impress me, Liam Callahan. So get that poor little girl out of your head, because I'm not her. Closing the small space between us, I glared down into her brown eyes, wanting to rip them from her oval-shaped face. I am brash. I'm wild. So says the woman who blasted her way into a private meeting, nearly killing her future in-laws. You do not know me, Giovanni. Do not be fooled by my wit and charm. It has taken all my strength not to kill you. What wit? What charm? You're nothing but talk, and I do not need to know you, Callahan. I just need to marry you. With that, she held her head high and left. I would not bow down. She would not bow down. The gravity of our situation was starting to eat away at me. I needed this to work. The Irish needed this to fucking work. But how the hell was I going to handle a lifetime of horror? A hot-blooded Italian boss. Step one. Except she was a damn boss. Step two. Hide all the knives, guns, and maybe the pillows, too. Nine. One murder makes a villain. Millions, a hero. Numbers sanctify, my good fellow. Monsieur Verdot. Melody. There was something about Liam Callahan. He was immature, rowdy, and impatient. Those were just the kinder things I could think of, and yet I knew he smelled like cinnamon, spices, and apples. I had taken the time to reflect on his scent, even enjoyed it. Ugh. On top of that, I enjoyed how he looked up close, the way he flexed his muscles out of habit and cracked his knuckles when he was tense. I had noticed all of that in just two days. I had a whole arsenal of men under my control, and many were attractive in some way, shape, or form. And yet there was something about Liam Callahan. When he stepped out of his room, he was dressed in dark pants paired with a black and green vest with a letter C on the breast. He looked surprised to see me, as if he wasn't sure why I was there. On his arms were bruises and scars from our fight. The idiot should have treated them, but instead he had to be a man's man and leave them. Took you long enough, Callahan. Did you need to fix your hair? He glared at me before smirking. It's called sex hair for a reason. That's the only way I fix it. You done being a bitch. Before I could respond, Fidel came down the hall. Ma'am, the helicopter is ready. Monty is fine, and we are ready to aid, he said, waiting for orders. I already contacted Monty, and he'll tell you what to do. His eyes widened, knowing what I meant. He just lost his title as right-hand man, the fucker. 
Next time, Fidel, when I tell you to fall on your sword, do it without hesitation. You waste my time and insult my intelligence with a statement like, We're outnumbered. That is all. He nodded and left quickly, leaving Mr. Sexhair and me alone. Liam stared at Fidel's back with narrowed eyes, and then turned his glower on me. I cut in before he could speak again. The helicopter is lifting us to Delaware. The flight is an hour. From there we are taking a speedboat north. The GPS is picking up the signal fifteen clicks from shore. However, the Valero are already aware of your stunt and will most likely have men in the water trying to recoup any lost drugs. Stepping forward, I made sure he understood I was not playing. First, you see what I'm doing? Telling you every detail of this? Yeah, that's what you should have done. Second, this is my operation now. My men... So if you fuck it up, I will slit your throat and then fill you with bull— His eyes lit up like fire before he grabbed me and threw me against the wall. Every moment you waste roaring at me is a moment against us, Captain Bechelot. As smart as your plan is, it would have been better to have snipers in the air. Something I thought of before I even stepped out here. I just grinned. Even with his arm on my neck, he thought he was so fucking smart. You are so right. Which is why I already have Neil and Antonio locked, loaded, and waiting. Anything else you assume I didn't think of? When will you get that while you've been number two for Daddy, I've been number one? He said nothing, just glared. You should release me, Captain Dipshit, or lose your arm, your choice. I didn't wait, I broke free. I was tiny compared to him, so all I needed to do was drop down and roll out of his grip. He had so much to learn, and this was his time to do it. Due to the fact that I had shot up Cedric's house, the party that they had thrown in my honor had ended and everyone departed. Outside there were four motorcycles, two of which were taken by Declan and Monty, the other two for Liam and me. Mine white and his green and black. He looked at me as if I was a china doll and all I could do was roll my eyes before jumping on my bike and taking off as soon as one of their people opened the gate. Only a second had gone by before I saw him skyrocket past me almost cutting me off, the sour brat. So I sped up beside him. We raced through the back streets of Chicago, the lights from the buildings up above us all blending together in a single streak. No matter how much gas I gave while weaving in and out of traffic and intersections, he was always winning. I could only get in front of him for a second before he would shoot past me out of nowhere. It was as if he was toying with me. By the time we got to the silver luxury-style helicopter parked privately at the airstrip, Declan and Monty were right behind us. Liam was already off his bike, arms crossed with a grin on his face, as if he had waited hours. The asshole. Saying nothing to him, I walked right on board to find Antonio and Neil salivating over sniper rifles like kids on Christmas morning. At least I don't have to worry about Irish and Italian feuding between them. I'm glad to see your loyalty is still so easily bought, brother. Liam glared at Neil as he took a seat. Or not. Neil froze, and I saw a speck of anguish go through his eyes. Liam must have seen it as well, because he didn't stop whatever mental assault he was delivering. It was like he could see into his brother's soul. Can all siblings do this? Jinx, I said as loudly as possible. Liam, Declan, and Neil all looked around to find the person behind the name, but no one came. A second later, the helicopter's engine kicked on, and a soft voice broke out over our headphones. Benvenuto al bordo, ma'am. I will have us to Delaware in forty. Monty sat before me in the seat Fidel normally would be in, and then turned to Liam, who also sat across from me. Jinx is our master aviator. If it goes in the sky, he can fly it. That's his name, Neil asked. Jinx, I feel safer already. Monty sneered. If he's good enough for the boss, he's good enough for you, can eh? Antonio snickered. Can he? What the fuck did you just call me? So much for no feuding. It means dog. Liam glared at me. Was he waiting for me to do something? His brother started it. Rolling my eyes, I looked to Monty, who muttered something under his breath. Neil hunched over like the cane, focused in on his rifle. I knew Antonio could shoot to kill in any sort of condition. The wind and the darkness of the evening wouldn't be an issue. It wasn't the first time he had done it in such conditions. However, I was testing Neil, and if he didn't pass, this would be the last time he worked closely with me, at least until he became better. I already had an idea of Declan's skills, seeing as he was the one who had hacked into my computers. 
I made it easy for him, but he still did it quicker than I expected. You will be monitoring the GPS, Liam stated, finally catching up. Monty nodded, and Liam turned to me. Declan can hack into the surrounding frequencies and keep track. The area should be filled with paramedics, cops, and the Coast Guard. Liam said, and in his eyes he was daring me to agree. Now of all times. Seeing as how he was being a good little boy, I would let him have his moment of dominance. Monty looked at me, and I nodded. I had planned to have Declan on the sea with me, since he was great with hand-to-hand -hand combat as well, and we may need it. But sure, Liam could pretend he helped. Once finished, Monty stood up quickly to get out of the negative bubble created by Liam and myself. He did not say a word, but I could see Liam's mind racing, and I could tell he didn't like me being here. I almost wanted to tell him to get the fuck over it, but the helicopter was tense enough. Declan and Monty were focused on the four sets of laptops between them, while Antonio and Neil both kept checking their rifles. They seemed close already, since Neil threw him a pack of chewing tobacco and Antonio accepted it like it was gold. One moment they were fighting, the next they are trading toys. Finally, when my eyes fell back to Liam, I found him watching me. He didn't look away like most people would when caught staring. Instead, he just stared harder, as if I were a book he was trying to read, but it was in a language he didn't understand. Yes? He shook his head. We're here. And sure enough, the helicopter began its illegal descent on the beach. Sir, ma'am, Declan said, looking between us both. We have a problem. What? Liam and I said at the same time. Monty clicked away at his computer. The Valero have just gotten the recorder and are heading further out to sea. They have a boat waiting. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the button overhead. Jinx, take us! I looked over at Declan and Monty for the coordinates. 3809. Minus seventy-two fifty, they both said quickly. Liam nodded, looking over at Antonio and Neil as the helicopter pulled up. They'll bring it to us. Melody and I will wait on their boat. You guys will shoot from the door. They nodded while Liam stood up and looked over to me. He was doing so well until he opened his mouth again. Or you can shoot, and Neil and I can go. Standing up, I glared right back at him. Give me a rifle and the bullet goes in your spine, I told him as I waited by the helicopter door. Jinx was going to have to circle around continuously. Liam stood in front of me, hand on the door handle, and just stared at me once again. Always with the staring, the creeper. For a moment, in the midst of the storm that was in his eyes, I saw worry. He was fucking worried about me, the fucker. This was not my first, nor would it be my last, jump out of an aircraft. He needed to grab his balls and take a shot of testosterone because I wasn't worried for shit. I just wanted this over so I could drink myself to sleep. Monty walked over to hand us parachutes, but we both shook our heads. They would only slow us down enough to be shot. We need to drop down quick and hard. Jinx, take us as low as possible, I said. Our stomachs dipped as we felt the helicopter drop. Somehow, knowing before Jinx even had to speak, Liam opened the door. In the darkness of the night, we could both see the yacht waiting below. He looked back at me, but I ignored him and pushed off the wall to jump. The moment the cold breeze hit my skin, I braced myself for the impact of the deck. When my body landed, I rolled as bullets came flying my way. Grabbing onto my gun, I turned and shot one Russian right between his eyes, just as Liam dropped onto the shoulders of another. There were screams and curses in Russian as Liam dove right beside me. Come here often, he said chuckling, as adrenaline clearly pumped through his veins. I supposed he was no longer seeing me as a china doll in that moment, but instead as another person on his side. Finally, the dipshit. Not really. I tried not to smirk back as more Russians came shooting at us. The hospitality here is fucking shit. You should write a strongly worded letter. Rolling my eyes, I turned and shot a man on the top deck in the kneecap. This is more echo-friendly. Save the trees and all that shit. He grinned and then shot the man now screaming in pain in the head. I was never good at recycling. Two men came forward, one right behind Liam and another behind me. We both raised our hands as they yelled at us. Tukavi! Vilachi! They shouted at us. Liam smiled at me. He truly smiled for once, obviously enjoying this. Ya, yeah, Liam Callahan. Eta my schneer. Vitoisha mjertve. This is my fiancé, and you two are dead. Just as the man finished, bullets went into the side of their heads, courtesy of Antonio and Neil before the helicopter spun out of view once again. 
A second later, Liam's phone rang, and he placed it on speaker. They're four miles away, and will be there shortly, Declan said. Liam said nothing before hanging up as I reached down to grab their guns. Yargin or Stechkin pistol? I asked him, causing him to frown. The Russians can't make guns for shite, he said in disgust, and he had a point. Smiling, we began to throw the few bodies overboard as we waited for our friends. It only took a second, and by that time we had thrown the overweight drunken Russians off. The boat was silent, except for another crew as they made their way back on deck. They stumbled and laughed like fools. Vetarchovsky, Nogrtishi Yursi, Chorba Pobral, Echtik Vagalish Vashal, Boera Subrayaskovitnas. All the fucking drugs are gone, damn those cunts to hell, Vance is going to kill us. One of the men asked where their brothers were, and Liam was already on his feet. Dead, Liam said as he shot one in the nose and I shot the other in the eye. He screamed in pain as I walked over and patted him down for the mini-equipment. Once I had it, I shot him once more for the heck of it. I'll call the guys, I said, handing it to Liam, but once I turned around I found myself looking down the barrel of a gun. It was the man whom Liam landed on, and he had his gun pointed right at me. Before I could even move, Liam pulled me out of the way and shot the fucker in the face, but not before taking one in the arm. Fuck it all to hell, he said, pulling back his wounded limb. He must have left his guardian angel at home. Jinx, head in. We'll meet you on shore. We're fine, for the most part, I said before hanging up and grabbing Liam's arm. He pulled away. I'm fine. Just wish I didn't kill the fucker so I could torture him. You have a bullet in your arm, I glared at him. A Russian bullet, which you yourself said was shit. I'm going to take it out. I said I was fucking fine, Melody. Angry, I holstered my weapon before I shot him in the other arm, and then grabbed onto his wounded arm again, causing him to hiss out in pain. You are not fine, I pressed down harder. Now stop bitching and let me fix it, you asshole. I didn't allow him to speak before pulling him inside the cabin and pushing him onto the nearest bed. They must have been ready to eat, because alcohol and an array of meat, bread, and apples awaited them. Getting a napkin and a knife, I poured the alcohol over the blade and his wound before giving him the rest to drink. Hopefully the liquor would keep him quiet. He smirked at me before taking the bottle to his lips. I think I like you as a nurse. Glaring at him, I dug the knife into his bullet wound. You really shouldn't say stupid things to a woman with weapons. He hissed and roared in pain like a fucking baby, until I got the bullet out and used the napkin as a bandage. Drink and shut up. I'll be right back, I said to him before going back out on deck. I made sure to drag and throw the bodies off the boat before setting course back to the mainland. I also called Monty to let him and Liam's brother know what happened. It took me about an hour and a half. By the time I went back to Liam, he was frozen on the bed listening to the audio from the plane he had destroyed. All either of us could hear were screams, crying, and prayers. They brought back memories I would rather forget. Walking over, I pushed stop, and he was pulled out of his trance. I thought you were going to set the boat on autopilot, he said, proving just how out of it he was. Grabbing another napkin, I took the old blood-soaked one off and redid the bandage. Do not take a bullet for me again. He snorted before pulling away. No good deed goes unpunished. The correct words you're looking for are, thank you. I pulled tighter and he winced. The baby. Thank you, but don't do it again. The last thing I need is for any of my men to think I can't handle myself. You are so fucking ridiculous. Why must you always try to prove you're a cold-hearted bitch? Because a cold-hearted bitch is what I need to be. I snapped back, rising in front of him. You can fuck up as many times as you want, but at the end of the day, no one will doubt you. I, on the other hand, make one mistake and it's over. Some cocky asshole like you will come over and claim I'm too soft or that I don't have the balls. I've worked too hard to backtrack now. He said nothing. He knew I was right. I didn't have time to waste proving and reproving who I was. And in a way, they would be right, because I should have blown that plane up myself. I confessed, grabbing the wine from the table and leaning back against it. If I had, I would get the credit. You want credit? He eyed me up and down, his green eyes picking up only the dimmest light of the cabin we now shared. You want credit for the mass murder I committed? Don't say it like that. We are not serial killers. We do not kill for the fun of it or to cause chaos. It's just business. Every last person we kill is for family. 
If we do not kill them, they kill us. It's the way of the world. It's self-defense. It's survival. If it was your life for theirs, they would kill you in a second to save themselves or their family. Everyone is ruthless. They just don't know it. You do. I do. And that is why we are on top and will remain so. And you feel nothing. And I feel nothing, I repeated. He looked me in the eyes, and I hoped to God he understood, because I didn't know how else to explain it. It was that kind of thinking that made it easy for me to sleep at night. Neither do I, he said, and I believed him. I tried to move, but he grabbed onto my sides and held me in place. There was that look in his eyes, the hunger, the lust, and the caged animal dying to get out. Pulling me even closer, he pressed himself against me. Le Before I could speak, his lips were on mine, and he was pulling at my clothes. With his one good arm, he cupped my ass, and the other one cupped my breast as he rubbed himself against me. His lips hummed against my neck before he lifted me up, throwing me on the bed. He stopped for only a second to look me over, and the storm in his eyes raged worse than I had ever seen. This is your one and only chance to tell me to stop. Ten. It takes two to make a murder. They're the barn victims, born to have their throats cut, as the cut throats are born to be hanged. Aldous Huxley Liam She leered, and I could see the lust growing in her eyes until it reflected my own. You better not rip my clothes. Her brown eyes narrowed at me, and with that, every chain, lock, and bolt in my mind broke loose. I grabbed her by the ankle and spread her legs until she was no less than an inch from me taking her. I could feel her become wet just from the sheer closeness of our bodies. Brushing my hand on the side of her face, then against her lips, I grabbed onto her hair and pulled it back, allowing me to latch onto her neck. Neither of us needed to speak. We knew what we wanted, and there were not enough words in the human language to express what my tongue physically could as I bit licked and sucked on her neck. I felt like a fucking animal, but I could not stop myself. And by God's name, when she unzipped my vest and rubbed her cool hands all over my torso, I became ravenous. Pushing her back, I pulled off her top as quickly as possible, trying my best to do as she had asked and not rip the damn thing off her. However, it didn't work, and I heard a small tear before the top was in shreds. Damn it, Liam! She yelled at me, and I stopped pushing up to stare into her deep, dark eyes, my breath on her lips. Say it again. I muttered as I grabbed her breast through her bra. I would have preferred a lace one rather than a sports bra, but her breast was a fucking breast. Say what? Leaning in, I kissed her lips quickly before biting her bottom one. Then I kissed her cheek before I finally got to her ear and nibbled the lobe. I was losing my mind. I could feel it. All I wanted to do was devour each and every fucking part of her. My name. I whispered in her ear, and she shivered with pleasure. Say my name again, not in anger or disgust, but as you did just now, as if I am the only man in the world who can satisfy you. Because I was. I kissed down her neck once more. However, she grabbed me by the hair and brought me back to eye level. She said not a word, just gazing up at me for a moment before kissing me almost desperately. For once, she fucking kissed me first, and I couldn't help but think it was better than fucking heaven, until she flipped me onto my back. She straddled my waist and stared down at me before pulling her bra off. She kissed up my chest slowly, grinding herself against my cock as it begged for release. When she reached my neck, my hands went straight to her hair, and hers went to my pants. Thank fucking Christ. Flipping her over, I pinned her hands above her head and stared down at what was now mine. Her cheeks were flushed, her nipples erect, and I bent down to suck on them, as if they were begging me to do so. She moaned loudly as she tried to wriggle her hands free. Liam? She said, arching towards me. Again, I demanded as I moved to the next one, my tongue circling around her areola, teasing until she did as I said. But my girl never just gave in to me. Transferring both her hands to my right one, my left travelled into her pants, not stopping until it reached its target. I could feel her and that eclipsed the pain from my arm. She was dripping for me. The moment I cupped her, my girl's back rose off the fucking bed. You fucking bastard! 
she moaned, trying to rub her legs together in forced friction that I would not let her have. Again, I demanded once more, my lips travelling from her breast down to her waist slowly. I kissed every part of her, barely rubbing her wet pussy. She wanted more, and so did I, but she had to do what I wanted. But once again my girl wanted to make my life as difficult as possible, leaving me no other choice but to release my hold on her hands so I could pull her pants off completely. The moment my eyes saw the spring of honey begging for my tongue, I latched on, sucking and lapping up all the juices she had provided for me. She gasped, gripping onto my hair as she rubbed herself against my face. Liam! I pulled away only for a moment. Again? She refused, and so my finger found its way into her, and she gasped out in ecstasy. In and out, as fast and deep as possible, I pounded my fingers into her she ground into my hand, wanting the satisfaction only my cock would give, but trying her best to make do with the three fingers I had inside her. Just as she was reaching her climax, I stopped. Her eyes narrowed at me as she breathed deeply. You fuck her. Not yet. I whispered, stepping back to release my cock from the confines of my pants. She stared at it, and I let her just for a moment, before pulling her back to me. Before she even had time to think, I thrust deeply within her. Her back arched as she shouted in Italian. I pulled her even closer to me and went even deeper still, if such a thing could be possible. Wincing at how slowly I moved, I watched her tremble as my cock filled her. Say my name. I told her, almost stopping altogether as my cock throbbed. I was hoping and praying she would give in so I could have my way with her. She didn't, so I thrust forward quickly. Melody, for the love of God, just say my name. Instead she slipped slightly away from me before wrapping her arms around my neck. Mel, just Mel, she panted. Holding on to her waist, I eased back slowly before thrusting again. Say it, Mel. She kissed up my neck, then my ear before stopping at my lips, staring me deeply in the eyes. Hers were so dark I could see myself in them. Her breath was almost on my tongue, and I just needed to hear it. Liam. She hissed and kissed me deeply. My name was the key to open in the deepest levels of possession possible. I pushed her onto her back, causing both of us to cry out and hiss as my cock slammed into her over and over again. She moved in rhythm with me every thrust not missing a bait. She cried out my name over and over again. Grabbing her breast, I fucked her deeper, not even stopping when she screamed out her release. I wasn't even close to finished. She would come at least once more before I released in her. Pulling out of her, we both cried out in protest until I flipped her over and took her, holding her waist and shoulder as I forced myself deeper. Fuck, Liam, harder, she begged. Faster. And at both wishes I complied until I couldn't hold myself back any more, just as she couldn't, and we came together. Mo Marnin Mel I gasped before pulling out of her and falling onto the bed. Flipping onto her back, she tried to control her breathing before speaking. You can only call me Mel during sex. Why is that? I raised my eyebrow at her. You haven't earned it. I couldn't have this. After what had just happened between us, everything had changed, whether she knew it or not, and it started with me. Grabbing onto her, I rolled over her, allowing her space so my weight would do no harm. She looked at me surprised, but said nothing. What happened tonight will be repeated, I told her calmly, still trying to catch my breath. You are mine, and I am yours. But for this to work, you need to stop seeing me as a goddamned enemy, and more like your husband. Her eyes narrowed. My husband, you say? So I'm supposed to sit back, polish your shoes, and make dinner between fucks? Mel, I replied, moving down until I was at her entrance again. I guess it, I said to her before I thrust forward and buried myself into the tight place that was quickly becoming my new home. Do you? She hissed, trying to stay focused as I inserted myself deeper. Yes, I whispered, going for her neck again. You are not a housewife, I said, pulling out, only to slam myself in again. You do not want to be my arm candy. Slam! She reached up for my hair. You are a cold-blooded murderer. Slam! 
She moaned as sweat dropped from my chin onto her chest. You are a boss. Slam. You are my evolution. Slam. This time she grabbed onto my ass, trying to pull me closer. I'm willing to try to disregard my chauvinistic ways. Slam. To treat you as an equal. But you must fucking do the same for me, Mel. And with that I thrust into her repeatedly, her body moulded with mine, her breasts pushed up against my chest. She was so fucking tight I couldn't keep my eyes open. Her nails dug into my back and her legs wrapped around my waist, pulling me closer to her. Her hands waved into mine as we entangled ourselves, rising to the highest of climaxes and crashing together. Gasping for breath, I held her tightly. My arms wrapped around her while I used her breast as a pillow. We were both silent, allowing our breathing to fill the cabin, and neither of us let go of the other. You see me as a boss? Yes, and it annoys me because I want that title, I replied honestly, causing her to pull my hair. No matter how many times we fuck, Callahan, I will never just bow down to you. I will never let you rule me. I will not be your bitch to screw and command. I don't think you can handle that. Maybe it was the sex talking, or maybe my father's words were finally beginning to sink in, and I was starting to see a new way of getting what I wanted. All of what I wanted. Rolling off her, I looked up at the wooden ceiling, not speaking for a moment as I gathered my thoughts. In many ways, I can't, I told her. In my mind, there will always be a chauvinist. But I will fight it. You and I both know that once we're married, our companies will be one, which means there will only be one head, for a divided house cannot stand. Thank you, Abraham Lincoln, but I'm not giving up my claim as boss, she replied, and I knew she wouldn't. She wouldn't bow to me. The only way for this to work was to do the one thing I hated to do most, share. It was so simple. It made logical sense, but I was a greedy motherfucker, and in many ways so was she. We were two fucking alike. There is one head, but also a brain within it. Everything we choose for the company will be thought of together in our bed, and then we bring it to the men. We roll as one, together. She said nothing, and I allowed her to think it over as I breathed in the smell of sex. Our sex. The best fucking sex I'd ever had. Sex I never wanted to stop having. We won't always agree on everything, she whispered, and she was right. Everything we don't agree on, we fuck out. I enjoyed the thought. This is, after all, the longest interaction we've ever had without you shooting at me. Not yet, she said, sitting up. I loved how she didn't care if I saw her naked in the light. She didn't reach to cover herself. She just allowed me the pleasure of looking at her. My hands reached up to mess with a few strands of her hair. What do you say, my Mel? We end our war and join brains and bodies to destroy any against us. We become one ruthless person instead of two. You can just do that, she asked, eyeing me sceptically. You can just share like that? You don't seem the type. Because I'm not. But when I thought of what my life would be like when I married, I thought of a woman who would handle what I do and allowed me the pleasure of confessing my sins as I took her mercilessly. I replied, looking up at such women. And now I have a woman who takes part in them as well, who enjoys it, who does not shy away from it. If I can't share it with her, who can I share it with? My father was right. You are a sweet talker. She frowned and I hated the look of it, so I brushed my finger over her lips. I stared at her. I mean it, Mel. Join me and set the world on fire, and I won't take your title, no matter how much I once wished to. I wish for less fighting and more of this. I grabbed her face with one hand and her breast with the other. You are using sex to cloud my judgment, Callahan. I'm simply showing you another way. Because I'm tired of being at war with an opponent I can't kill. I whispered to her. You stand at my side and I stand at yours. And together we rule the east and the west so much that they'll rename cities after us. The Valero? She bit her lip as I pinched her nipples. 
Leaning forward, I took one of them into my mouth and pulled her close to me. We put a bullet in each one of their heads, and then fuck in their beds. I replied as she pushed me onto my back and grabbed hold of my cock. I felt it jump alive in her hands. She bent down and licked the tip of it. Are you lying to me, Callahan? Before I could reply, she took me in her mouth and I moaned incoherently, words I wasn't even sure were English. I could barely even think straight her mouth was that heavenly. Forget Natasha and any of the other bitches I had been with. Had I known this was what waited for me, I would have come here long ago. Well, Callahan? She ran her teeth along my length and I shivered. Fuck no, Mel, I'm not fucking lying. My hands went to her hair. You and I work as one, she asked me before sucking down harder, making me almost come in her mouth. My head went back and I tried to hide how blissful this felt. Jesus, yes, fuck, yes, you and me, no one else. We will, fuck, baby, oh, yes, we'll rule as one. Even now, as I'm sucking your cock, you will see me as an equal. She used her hands when she spoke before her magical mouth enveloped me once more. What was her question? Yes, fuck yes, even as you fucking suck me off, I still won't see you below me. Just as when you won't when I'm eating you out. I moaned, thrusting into her mouth. She took it and my hands went to the sides of her head as I fucked her mouth like I fucked her pussy, hard and fast. When I came, she sucked it all down her throat and wiped her mouth. Well, I guess I can handle that. But you fuck me over, Callahan. I will kill you. Let's get dressed and get this marriage over with so I can fuck you with a ring on both our fingers. She rose before me and lifted her torn top, groaning. You are such an ass. I would say sorry, but I wouldn't mean it, I said, rising from the bed as well. We stood there, staring at each other, both naked and both desperately in need of each other. One last fuck before we get married? That look in her eyes made me shiver. All I could do was smirk before pushing her against the wall. You and I, what a pair we make, I said, spreading her legs once again, and one of the many more times that would happen in the future, I hoped. You and I against the world, then, she asked me as I pushed inside her. With this fuck, we start a new chapter in our life, I hissed as I slammed into her. May we forever be rulers, may our enemies tremble at our fate. May we never forget our great love that is the family, which we will roll with an iron fist. May we be ruthless and have no regrets, she added, gripping onto my back. May we take what we want, when we want it, with the world at our feet. I smiled as I fucked her against the wall. We moved in sync. It was like our bodies were also agreeing to our package of glory, death and blood. Mrs. Callahan, we shall have the world soon. I said, never wanting to stop my hunt to go deeper within her. The tides were changing, and we must adapt to survive during drastic changes. And Mel was that drastic change. What we had was much bigger than the two of us, but as she moaned out my name, I couldn't be more grateful. She would help me fill the sky with the Valero blood. Once we did, we would rule. The thought added to the pleasure. It was the best fuck of my life. Eleven. I love the old way best, the simple way of poison, where we too are strong as men. Euripides. Melody. After hours of rescue missions and millions of prayers, we have yet to find any survivors of Flight 735. Our hearts go out to all the families affected by this great tragedy which was caused by a simple and unpredictable engine failure. The Callahan family has created a charity in honor of the victims and has already donated $15 million on behalf of Melody and Liam, who, as we know, are getting married this evening. Their wedding has been the talk of the town since we broke the story to you only three days ago. Apparently, the couple had been seeing each other in secret for quite some time now. The rumors of who were to attend this wedding range from U.S. Senators to the very top of the A-list. Ma'am, would you like me to turn it off? Adriana asked as she fixed my hair. Taking a sip of wine, I shook my head at her before looking into the mirror. 
Adriana, I do not want an updo. Screw tradition, I liked my hair down. Are you sure? Evelyn smiled kindly as she walked into my room. Tying the robe around myself just a little tighter, I smiled before standing up. Adriana left as quickly to get the dress that hung in the deepest, darkest part of my closet. I prefer it down. I stated when Evelyn walked up to me, looking me up and down, then nodded. Reaching over, she pulled the pin out of my hair and took a simple step back. Well, I must say you do look even more beautiful with it down. Thank you, Evelyn. Mel, please look at me. She asked, and when I did, her palm came right across my face so quickly I never saw it coming. Shocked, I touched the side of my cheek, unsure if I was dreaming or not. What the fuck? She didn't even flinch. So I'm guessing this is the real method to Giovanni, the girl who had the balls to step into my house, destroy my Jackson Pollock, and then shoot my fucking husband. Now I was starting to get angry. Standing straighter, I glared into her eyes. She got one slap, and that was it. The next time she raised her arm to me, I was going to break it. Before she could move, Adriana stood behind her with a gun to her skull. I grinned, wiping my cut lip thanks to her fucking ring. Evelyn, you should know better. Evelyn glared back, not even a little bit scared. I come to you as a mother, coming to a daughter. Had it been any one of my sons who had put a bullet in Cedric, I would have taken him out of this world so quickly they wouldn't even know it was me. I may not walk the same line as you do, nor do I wish to, but you should know that when it comes to my husband I will not hesitate to kill anyone. You cross the line. Look who has a spine. I nodded over to Adriana and she took a step back, walked over to the bed and pulled out my dress. Noted. I said, not even the least bit threatened. I was too amused for that. Cedric is off limits. He wasn't my target anyway, your idiot son was. She glared at me once again before smirking. It took me a long time to shift Cedric's view on women when I first met him. And again when he first learned about you. What? Cedric found out about me at the same time Liam did. Didn't he? Evelyn beamed. Like I said, I may not choose to walk the same path as you, but that doesn't mean I'm naive to the inner workings of this family. Everything Cedric has ever done, he has told me. The moment he knew what you were, he believed you were the best thing for my idiot son, as you so elegantly put it. He kept it a secret from Liam to let him deal with the information as he saw fit. I will commend you on your acting, and will expect it whenever you're in public with me. What you and Liam do is none of my concern. I just wanted to make sure you knew where you stand. And where is that? I wanted to bust her smug face in. It reminded me of Liam, for fuck's sake. Evelyn pulled out a small box, setting it on the table. The day you become my daughter. I will love you, stand by you, and when necessary put you in check. You may very well have the world in your hands, but you're still young, and that makes you just as stupid as my son is at times. I like you, Mel, so I hope the next time we speak in confidence, it's more civil. I said nothing as she looked over to the bed and grabbed my new white shoes. Christian Laboutin? She smiled before turning back to me. When we go to Paris in the spring, you, Caroline, Olivia, and I must go shopping. You have impeccable taste. That would be Adriana, but I shall take the invitation all the same, I replied, and she nodded before walking to the door. Well, I will leave you to it. The girls and I will come back later, if you don't mind. It didn't seem like a question, but I nodded anyway. When she left, I couldn't help but smile as I finished the rest of my wine. I was starting to like Evelyn. My moment of peace didn't last long, however. Liam walked in dressed in nothing but silk pajama bottoms as if we weren't getting married in a few hours. What is it with you people and not knocking? I glared at his chest before pouring myself more wine. I would have to make sure it was close by if I was going to get through the rest of this day. What did my mother want? The better question is, what do you want? I asked him, stepping forward. He towered over me, and the fact that I was in my underwear beneath the robe was not lost on either of us. Adriana, leave us. She froze, looking at me. Rolling my eyes, I nodded, and she stepped outside. The moment she was gone, he kissed me, opening up my robe so he could cut my ass. Pushing him away, I slapped him across the face. Just because we fucked already doesn't mean we need to jump each other every time we make eye contact. I snapped at him, despite the fact that he did look rather sexy. I didn't want him getting used to the idea that my body was his to do anything he wished with when he was horny. Maybe if we did, you would be kinder. I just snorted and turned away from him to the items on the bed. 
Callahan, seriously, what is it you want? We have the wedding of the decade to go to soon, I replied, stepping into my shoes. Those shoes make it hard not to have you right now, he said, staring at my legs. However, I will take pleasure in that later tonight. I just wanted to let you know that Vance and his son Amory will be attending. What the fuck? You do know this would be the perfect moment for him to strike back at you for what you did to the plane. I crossed my arms over my chest and his eyes went to my breasts. Jeez, you would think we hadn't had sex all night. If it weren't for Cedric's call, we'd both still be on that boat. Stepping forward, he let his hands trace up and down my sides. Well, love, as our new personal contract states, we now work together. My plans were either beef up security and enjoy the evening, or take a moment out of our night and poison the bastard right there and then. I frowned at the thought. First, do not call me love. Second, when Vance falls, I want him to watch his empire burn around him and know that he was outsmarted, outgunned, and fucked over. Drowning in the soup seems... Too easy. He agreed. Then the first option it is. I'm shocked, Mrs. Callahan. Did we just agree on something? Can it really be this easy? He cupped my breasts and I grabbed his dick tight enough for it to cause him pain. If that's all, sweetheart, I would like to spend my last few moments as a Giovanni by myself. Bitch. You too. I should have. He stopped himself before stepping up behind me. You look beautiful. See at the altar. Oh, and try not to flinch at the holy water. I won't if you won't, I replied, and he kissed me where my shoulder met my neck. He said nothing else before leaving, allowing Adriana to come back in. I sat down again, and she finished making the waves in my hair as I stared into my own reflection. His kiss brought back all his touches of the night before. He was amazing, with stamina that was unheard of. My body cried out for his, and my mind both hated and loved that. I loved being dominated in such a beastly sexual way. How his hands, lips, and tongue all grabbed onto me. He was the best partner I'd ever had. But I didn't want him to know that. I didn't want his head to become any bigger than it already was. I also didn't want him to think that just because he was a great fuck, that he held the key to making me bend. He said he understood, but the boss in me told me that everyone lies. People lied about how much they drank, how much they were in debt, how many people they had killed. People were liars. I always thought I was good at reading liars. I could see it in their eyes, and if I did, I would kill them. However, with Liam, I was lost. It was like I was blind. He seemed honest, but he was just like me. A master liar. Adriana, what do you think of Liam Callahan? She froze, not sure what to say. Adriana, you can speak freely. I'm sure you've dug up more dirt since we've been here. She nodded. Liam Callahan is cocky, arrogant, controlling, manipulative, hot-headed, and attractive. What makes it worse is that he knows it. He has bloodlust. He stares at people with such rage. It's as though he wishes for them to mess up so that he can put a bullet in them. However, the moment he looks at you, it's gone. He is content, which is far from the man I saw three days ago. He seemed a rather lonely and isolated person. From what I've gathered, he was a very ill child, to the point he was crippled. Add that to his high intelligence, and it made him a prime candidate for bullies throughout his early life. He keeps it private and is embarrassed about it, seeing as he is a Callahan. He was admitted to a hospital for almost a year, and from there, gradually became better. He trusts very few people, which includes his family. He's searching for something. I stared at her through the mirror, eyebrows raised before grinning. This was Adriana's talent. She was a profiler. A very good profiler. Everyone overlooked her, thinking she was just my personal maid. However, I kept Adriana close because she was my second pair of eyes. She saw people as if they were an open book and could collect information because no one noticed her. She wasn't a fan of the blood or the violence, and I wouldn't force her to be. She proved her worth often in times like this. So... You think I should trust him. Only you know, ma'am. You are a better judge of character than I. I think he wants you to care about him as much as his mother cares about his father. I don't think he's out to hurt you, yet. But he is still a Callahan, and the Irish are tricky. He is going to be your husband, and you are not cringing at the thought of it, ma'am. 
She was right, and I didn't know how to process that. It has been a long three days, I sighed, allowing my robe to fall as I stood. She nodded, grabbing my dress and holding it for me to step into. You look beautiful, Coraline said, beaming when she, Olivia, and Evelyn stepped in. Olivia looked sour, and I wouldn't have been surprised if she had figured out that I was the one who put a hole in her husband's arm. It's very simple, Olivia said, fingering the tattoo on her wrist and looking my dress up and down. If I weren't in all white and about to enter the house of God, I would have bashed her head in. Some people have to try harder than others. Others can make simple look elegant. Agreed, Evelyn said. Apparently she and I had come to a new agreement. Did you give her the bracelet? Caroline asked, even though Evelyn was already walking towards the desk to pick up the small box. She opened it, and my eyes widened ever so slightly. The vintage bracelet was made of all pearls, with a pendant in the center embedded with the letter C. It had to be from the early 1900s, at least. Something old. All the Callahan women wear it during their wedding. It was the gift given to the wife of the first boss. She smiled and placed it on my wrist. Thank you, I replied, and for the first time it hit me. I was getting married today. We should get going. Cedric is waiting. Olivia said, frowning and clearly pissed that the moment was happening between everyone but her, the bitch. Cedric? I asked. No one met my gaze. Why is Cedric waiting? Where is my father? Liam. So, what happened on the boat, ma'am? Neil asked me for the billionth time as we waited in St. Peter's Cathedral. Mind your own fucking business, and if you call me lamb again, Neil, I will kill you, then bury you under this church. He smirked. You're excited. You didn't even describe how you'd kill me. That boat ride must have. Before he finished, I punched him in the fucking nose. For the love of mother fucking fuck! Last chance, brother, or you're gonna piss me off, I replied, fixing my tie. Lay him calm down before you get blood on your suit. I'm sure Melody wouldn't mind, but the press... Declan sighed and threw a cold beer at Neil, who held it on his nose. Neil mumbled something under his breath and left. One day you two will have to work out your issues, Declan said to me. One day, maybe, but not fucking today. Saying nothing, I took a deep breath and walked out the door that led to the front of the cathedral. Looking outside, I noticed my mother had made sure to invite every last motherfucker with a net worth over a hundred million. They all looked like tourists, excited to be on the guest list. My eyes met Vance's, and I could feel the blood in my veins begin to run hotter. He smirked, nodding at me as though he was fucking proud, the bastard. Next to him sat Amory. The golden locks wannabe was all but sucking on Natasha's neck. It had seemed Deep Throat had switched ships. She winked at me, and I wanted to puke. How is security? Declan snickered. They would have a better chance of getting the president than any one of us today. If this doesn't go off perfectly, shoot him for good measure. I wanted to be the one to take Vance's life, but if it needed to be done today, then I didn't care who did it. Just worry about Melody and pray she doesn't run away. No, she wouldn't run. Running wasn't in her nature. She would come if only to kill me. Before he could reply, music rang throughout the church and the door opened slowly, making my heart rate quicken. A vision in white stood beside my father with a bouquet of blood-red roses in her hands. She didn't bother with a veil to cover her face, and for that I was fucking glad. She was beautiful, deadly, stunning, and all mine. When she reached me, she stopped and kissed my father on the cheek before taking my hand. However, when I looked in her eyes, I saw a twinge of sadness, and it pained me to my car. I squeezed her hand not to hurt her, but to tell her I saw it, and I didn't like it. I wanted her to be happy. I would let her pick anyone in the church to kill if it would make her smile. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the face of not only God, but the world, to join together Liam Alec Callahan and Melody Nietzsche Giovanni in holy matrimony. Everything he said after that faded when she squeezed my hand back. She glanced up at me, and the lioness in her eyes wasn't gone, but simply asleep. Something was wrong, and I hated that I couldn't figure it out. 
Liam Alec Callahan, do you take Melody Nietzsche Giovanni to be your wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish? Do you promise to be faithful to her until death do you part? I do, always. I said without any hesitation, and she snickered at me, shaking her head as I placed the wedding band on her finger. Melody Nietzsche Giovanni, do you take Liam Alec Callahan to be your husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and cherish? Do you promise to be faithful to him until death do you part? I do, always. She replied, and I felt overflowing relief and joy as she slid my ring into place. May these rings be blessed, so he who gives it and she who wears it may abide in peace and continue in love until life's end, he said as we stared at each other. You may now seal the promises you have made to each other with a kiss. In that moment it didn't feel like our lips met. It was as though our souls did. Mel, my Mel, wiped the lipstick from my lips. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the loving couple, Mr. and Mrs. Liam Callahan, the priest said while Mel rolled her eyes at me. Apparently, Mrs. Liam Callahan didn't sit well with her, but too fucking bad. Everyone rose from his or her seat, clapping and cheering as we walked down the aisle hand in hand. We stopped at the top of the stairs to take photos for every damn magazine in the world when my father leaned in beside me. I believed both of your emotions, so will the world. He whispered with a smirk as we smiled. Do you believe the emotions? Did it only take Russian blood and a boat ride? I said nothing before stepping into the Rolls Royce to take a seat beside my wife. What's wrong? Nothing. Sighing, I leaned in and held the side of her face so she would have to look me in the eye. Wife. What is wrong? She stared before sighing as well. Husband, my father refused to walk me down the aisle. He's gotten worse. With that, she ripped her head from my hand and glared at the window. I felt like a bloody moron. I was so focused on horror, I didn't even think about the person walking her down the aisle. Melody G. Callahan had the ability to make me forget anyone else existed when she was near. After we do our time at the reception, if you want, we could sneak out and go see him. She looked at me and her eyes narrowed. Is this you trying to be sweet? Because I'm fine and I would prefer to deal with asshole Callahan. You know, the son of a bitch I fought in my basement who thought his balls were bigger than they actually are. And there was the lioness again. I'm putting an effort. Maybe you should fucking try it, Melody. I'm planning on going to war with the entire world. I don't need one with the woman sleeping beside me. Neither of us spoke after that. She knew just how to fucking kill the mood. Not looking at me, she took my hand into hers and squeezed it before letting me go. I've never been nice. I'm not used to being anything other than a Giovanni. Affection and tenderness are not our strong suits. So I do not know how to reciprocate that. Bitch is standard mode for me, and I will work on it. I don't mind you being a bitch to anyone else, as long as it's not me. I whispered, taking her hand and kissing it quickly. Part of me was starting to enjoy her ripping out other people's hearts. It was her thing, and she was good at it. She laughed, and I enjoyed the sound. You do know that we have known each other only for seventy-two hours? Holy fuck. I feel like I've known you for decades. If not longer. Really? She asked. What's my favorite color? Fuck. Melody. When we got to the reception, which was being held outside Callahan Manor, there were more photographers, who Evelyn allowed to take photos from a distance. My face felt as though it would break from all the forced smiling. Call them off, or I'm calling snipers, I said to Liam. He leaned down to kiss my cheek. I would gladly, but my mother and father want good press. I glared at him, pinching his arm until he pulled me away from the cameras and headed towards the sea of guests. There were more damn photos and fake congratulations there, until I saw Vance and Amory making their way through all the drinking and celebrating in the courtyard. 
Our guests danced underneath the stream of lights, blissfully unaware that two of the most deadly men in the country were about to collide with another deadly pair. Both Vance and Amory were as slick as eels with their dark eyes and oily skin. Amory stood at the same stunted height as his father, even though Vance was rather stout and Amory was sickly thin. They shared many of the same traits, blonde hair, though Vance's was graying, a strong chin and small ears. Remember the Valero do not know that I took over for my father, I whispered, making sure that it seemed as though I was nothing more than an excited bride. Behind Liam I saw Neil and Declan step closer to us. Monty and Fidel were near the entrance, focused on me. With a glance, Fidel let me know Antonio and three other snipers were in the windows of the manor, waiting. Oh, and you should know that Vance tried to arrange a marriage with Amory and me years ago. His eyes widened before narrowing into dangerous slits of green. Mr. and Mrs. Callahan, Vance said as he reached us. Congratulations. I must say this was a huge surprise. Melody, what a fine young woman you have become, hasn't she, Amory? I'm sorry, do I know you? I asked innocently, squeezing Liam's hand. He needed to step up and be calm. Amory looked at me with pure lust, making me want to cut his eyes out and doing nothing to help Liam calm down. He sneered, shaking Vance's hand, which had been extended for me. This is Vance Valero, love, the owner of the company that keeps stealing many of our products. Vance glared dangerously, as did Amory, before he smiled at me. I do not wish to bore your beautiful little head with such youthful fiction. Your father and I were quite close. I was hoping to speak with him. However, he seems to be absent from this joyful occasion. I tried not to gag. Liam and I wanted to get married. My father spoke of some new huge business venture in Austria that he needed to get a jump start on. I will let him know you spoke of him. Amory's eyes widened before he grinned and reached out for my hand, but Liam took it instead. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but my wife and I must be making the rounds. Please enjoy yourselves. Yes, please do, I added, smiling as though I was naive to the tension between them. Evelyn has worked so hard on this day. We are lucky to afford such a lifestyle. One day you could be sitting at the top of the world, and then the next it could be sitting on you. So my father says. Your father has always been wise. Amory winked at me before glaring at Liam. But we are all human and make mistakes. Fuck you, you no-good motherfucking asshole. When we walked away, Liam pulled us onto the dance floor under the purple and red draping. What the fuck is going on in Austria? I know that's the last place your father is. Calm the fuck down. Nothing is in Austria, but Amory doesn't know that. He is a leech, and I have no doubt he'll be on the next plane trying to steal from us. Plus, if we divided him and Vance, it would be easier to break them. His hand wandered down my spine. You want them to think you don't know anything. It's easier to kill a deer if they think you're a rabbit rather than a wolf. Amory was so busy staring at my breasts he couldn't even speak. I noticed. I should just kill the motherfucker now and save myself the annoyance. He's lucky I didn't rip his eyes out, and believe me, I would have. The darkness in his voice made me shiver in pleasure. I allowed him to spin me before bringing me in close. You need to clear your mind and take a deep breath. We were able to flip Ryan Ross. He reports directly to Monty now, then to me. It's how I knew Vance knew about the plane. He wants to do something bigger. He wants to relax before he attacks. But mostly, he wants to hurt you. And how the fuck is Vance gonna hurt me? Me, I answered. He will want to use Amory as a way to gain intel. Amory will probably flirt with me and try to gain my trust. It wouldn't be the first time you went after a married woman. You aren't making my desire to kill the foul lesson. He stopped to look me in the eyes. In fact, I want to kill him more. Then I get to kill Vance. He wasn't going to get to kill them both. I kill Vance. You get the brothers and Amory. Deal. But the only way for that to happen is to give Amory a little wiggle room and some rope to hang himself with. So, more parties and balls. My mother will like it. However, I will cut off the motherfucker's fingers if they touch you. But until then, Valero has a shipment of priced cars coming two weeks from now to Italy. 
Vance loves his cars. The bastard was getting excited just thinking about it. You hid his drugs, and now you want to take his toys? Husband, that is quite cruel. He raised an eyebrow at me. Do you have any other ideas? No, I grinned. But after we steal them, we should set them on fire. And I'm cruel. He kissed my cheek and I froze for a moment, realizing we had once again just worked together with ease. It was like our minds fed off each other. We will talk about this later. Apparently, it's time to cut the cake. I told him, noticing Evelyn waving. I had almost forgotten this was our wedding, with the thoughts of theft and blood in the air. Yes, later. He replied, looking at me with lust once again. Liam. It felt like hours after we cut the cake when we were able to sneak off. Orlando was in one of the rooms in the eastern part of the manor. The moment we arrived, Mel went to sit beside him. He was breathing only through tubes and machines, which all looked painful. Ciao, mi bambino dolce. Mel kissed his hands. Ciao, mi dolce padre. Sei bellissima, Melody. Me dispiace che non ero abbastanza forte per voi. Tu sei... E sarai sempre abbastanza forte? I felt bad for intruding on their moment. I wasn't sure what they were saying, but it seemed too personal for me to just be standing there. However, I couldn't bring myself to leave Mel's side. Orlando looked up at me, breathing heavily, waiting for me to take his hand. When I did, he squeezed it. Si buona con lei, Liam, he said to me before turning to Mel. Si buona con lui, Mel. Lo farò, she said, and I repeated it, even though I didn't know what it was she said. It just felt right. When I did, he kissed both our hands before giving them back to each other. Mel closed her eyes, taking a deep breath, and stood up. I watched as she pulled the needle from the nightstand, and then I realized what she was about to do. Reaching out, I grabbed her hand. For the first time, I saw the true depths of her strength and how much she hated it. She would put her father to sleep to give him peace, and it would kill her slowly every day of forever. Yet she would still do it. I have to do this, she whispered to me as I tried to pull the needle from her. Shaking my head, I snatched it from her hand. You will hate yourself, and I would rather you hate me. In her eyes, there was a fight, because she was Mel, and my Mel would always fight me. But I would win this battle. Stepping in front of her, I pulled the cap off with my teeth before going for his arm. Mel wrapped her hands around my waist and placed her head on my back, not watching. Good. I didn't want her to see this. I did it as quickly as possible and turned off the machines before turning and holding her. Melody I just listened in Liam's arms, not crying or depressed, but somewhat relieved that someone else had fulfilled my father's wish something I had dreaded since he'd first asked. We stood there holding each other for God knows how long before Liam spoke. Wife, Mel, my melody, let's go to bed, he whispered, and I nodded. He lifted me up, bridal style, and a part of me wanted to fight him, but not now, not tonight, not our wedding night, not my father's last night. I knew I would fight him on a million things soon. But not tonight. Twelve. Cruel with guilt and daring with despair, the midnight murderer bursts the faithless bar, invades the sacred hour of silent rest, and leaves unseen a dagger in your breast. Samuel Johnson. Liam. Is that all, sir? Dylan questioned softly, placing the tray of food and the foils I requested on the top of my desk. He knew just as well as anyone that if he woke my wife, I would snap his neck. Tell Patrick I want to know of Amory's whereabouts in the next few hours. The moment the door closed, I turned to Mel, only to find her sitting up and staring back at me. Her face was void and her eyes clear as day. It was almost haunting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wake you. I said, leaving distance between us as I tried to read her mood. She frowned, 
noticing that she was still in her dress, before standing up and turning around. Help me out of it. Without saying a word, I unhooked the tiny part at the top and unzipped it slowly, trying my best not to get excited. But it didn't work. Her fucking father just died. Calm down. Saying her in nothing but white lace almost killed me. Fuck it all to hell. Let me get you. She stopped me with her lips and I gave in, gladly pulling her body to mine and gripping her ass. I loved her ass. I loved how it felt like it was made from my hands only. When her tiny hands pulled away my tie and ripped at my shirt, I had to push her away. Mel, we can wait. I can wait. I gasped, breathing deeply to control my rage and cock. Well, this isn't about you. This is about me, and I can't wait. I don't want to think. I just want you inside me now. Fuck. This time when she kissed me, I picked her up and laid her back down on the bed, kissing a path from her lips to her neck. She moaned, pushing up against me with her hands in my hair while I worked my way down to her breast. I will buy you new ones, I told her as I ripped the bra from her, allowing her breasts to bounce in freedom, and pulled her underwear off. She glared at me, but only for a moment before closing her eyes as I pinched her nipples. Harder, she asked so I did, pulling on them before taking them into my mouth. She was already rocking against me. I knew she wanted me inside her, but I wouldn't give in just yet. My hands travelled down to cup her, and she arched up in pleasure. Just fuck me already, Liam. She moaned, grinding herself into my hands. No, I replied, placing three fingers in her. I watched, enjoying how she looked as she met her pleasure with my hands. I moved my fingers deeper and faster into her wet car. Each time she let out small moans of pleasure while one of her hands went to my chest and the other pinched her breast. Watching her, this hungry for my cock, made my desire for her grow even more. I made sure to take mental pictures of this. Liam, your cock! No, I snickered, fucking her with my fingers even more until she was so close that I pulled out of her. She stared at me, furious and wide-eyed. She looked enraged, and all I could do was lick my fingers which dripped of her juices. She watched me for a moment before tackling me. I stared up at her in amusement, holding on to her thighs as she ripped my pants to get at my dick. She didn't have to wait, because the moment she pulled my pants from me it sprang up before us. This was why I chose to go without boxers. She glared at me, grabbing onto me, and I bucked up at her unable to control myself in her hands. You want this just as bad as I do, she said, and I was almost tempted to tell her, no fucking duh. However, when she eased her way onto me, I couldn't even think straight. My hips began to move, pushing my cock entirely in her. She was moving too slowly, watching me struggle to fight back the urge to ram my way in her until she couldn't walk. How quickly the tables turn, she whispered. I gasped when she leaned down to kiss my chest. Grabbing onto her waist and hair, I held her on top of me before sitting up. I was done playing around. I just wanted to fuck her so deep that she wouldn't be able to see straight. And how quickly they change back. Gripping her waist, I forced her to move along with me, fucking her as we sat in the middle of my bed. She looked me in the eyes as I looked into hers. Our lips were only inches apart, breathing each other in as she rode me. Reaching up, I brushed the side of her face and pulled her hair, along with her head, back, so I could kiss her neck. Then I pushed her down onto the bed and rammed myself harder. She moaned and I couldn't help but smile. Fucking Jesus, Liam! Leaning down, I kissed the side of her face before whispering, Not even he can save you from this. Holding onto her wrist with one hand and gripping her thigh with the other, I fucked her pussy hard, ramming farther and farther inside her as she trembled with pleasure. Fuck, Mel! I yelled as I felt her walls tighten around me, but even then I didn't stop. I wanted to fuck her pretty little brain out, so I let go of her hands and grabbed onto her hips. I fucked her like she was a bitch in hate. I went quickly. I went deeply. I went in and out so many times I couldn't even see straight, and she was screaming my name while clawing at my back. She had come twice already, and I would keep making her come until she was filled with only me. Slowing my thrusts down only slightly, my head went back as I released in her just as she came for the third time. 
Drained, I forced myself to hover over her, not wanting to crush her. However, she surprised me and pulled me on top of her. So I just laid there on her breast, leaving small kisses on her neck. Thank you. You never have to thank me for sex. In fact, she could have it any time she fucking wanted. Not only for the sex, Liam. Stopping my kisses, I sat up to stare in her eyes. But she refused to look at me. My dear wife, you do not have to thank me for that either. I kissed her cheek before finally pulling out of her. I was going to bring up condoms later, and hopefully she didn't want them either. We didn't speak for a moment as I lay next to her. Instead, the smell of sex and our breathing was the only thing to fill the room. What do you want from me, Liam? I wasn't sure how to say it, without sounding like a pansy. But I knew if I lied, she would know, and the last thing our relationship could handle was a lie, whether it was big or small. I want you to love me, I said softly. But if not, then I want it to be the closest thing to you loving me. I want your loyalty. I want your honesty. I want you by my side and no one else's. I want your body. I want your mind. I want to know your hopes and dreams so I can one day make them a reality. I paused, knowing the sicker inner darkness part of me was about to speak. But that was who I was and I wanted her to know it. I hadn't even realised I wanted it until now. I want you to be willing to kill for me. I want you to be the same killer I am and not flinch away from the blood. I want you to revel in the blood alongside me. I want you to help me take down every fucker who stands in the way of a Callahan. She was silent, and so was I as we lay there. The second part of that I can do with ease, she finally replied. The first, the love, I haven't loved anything in a long time. I cared for Orlando deeply, but we were never close. I spent most of my life training. He was working. I wouldn't know where to start with love. It wasn't a no. It was just a how, and I would have to show her. I took her hand kissing it before sitting up. We will start by getting to know one another. I replied, loving how she looked in my bed. Our bed. Know each other? Like, what the fuck is your favourite colour and other not important but important things like that? It's teal. I do not know why, but it's teal. Smiling, I got up, naked as the day I was born, and grabbed the plate of food, the wine, and the files, and placed them before us on the bed. She picked up the wine and smirked. You know my favourite wine. I do. I replied, uncorking it and not telling her how I knew. She didn't need a cup and drank straight from the bottle before handing it to me. I drank as well, laughing in my mind about how far I'd come. Had it been any other female, I would have seen them as less as a woman. But with Mel, it only made her sexier to me. Everything she did made her sexier. What's your favourite colour? She asked, taking a bite of sandwich. I don't have one. She shook her head at me. Favourite movie? I asked her. Shawshank Redemption, she said. Seriously? Yes, seriously. What's yours, then? She asked. Goodfellas, I said, winking and causing her to roll her pretty brown eyes at me. Of course. I'm also a huge superhero, Nord. She looked me over before nodding. I can see that. Shut up, I said, as she laughed. It wasn't forced or harsh, but soft like bells chiming in the wind. She brought her legs in and I noticed she was still wearing her white heels, which meant a few things. One, I fucked her in her heels and that was fucking hot. Two, she looked fucking sexy sitting on my bed naked with only heels on. And third, she almost always wore white shoes. I would make a note of that whenever I bought her something, but still. Why do you wear white heels all the time? Is it an Italian fashion statement or something? She froze for a moment before her shoulders dropped and her eyes glazed over. Orlando and my mother, Avelia, fought often when I was a child. I was young, but even I knew something was wrong. 
On the outside, they put on a show of this happy, well-off couple. But really, my mom was living in a different wing of the house. She even spent most of her time in Italy. Sometimes, after her fights with my father, I wouldn't see her for weeks. When they were young and fell for each other hard, my father didn't want to lose her, so he only told her about what he did for a living after they were married. She frowned, drinking from the bottle again. Shit. There was no way a relationship in our lives could work if we didn't make it clear who we were from the get-go. Yup. She shook her head. From what I gathered, my mom was a hippie. She hated violence, and like all hippies, she protested. My grandparents wouldn't let her get a divorce, and so she wore white gloves. Basically, she was telling Orlando every time he saw her that her hands were clean. She told him if he could go a week without killing, she would take them off and he could touch her. But it never happened. My father turned to whores, pretending they were her, and she fell in love with her bodyguard. However, she was pregnant with me, and my father told me that she miscarried once while they were dating so she didn't want to risk anything the second time around. They tried to stick it out for my sake, but Orlando finally gave up trying to win her over, and they agreed to let me spend the holidays with him. It was like that until the plane crash. And so, you wear the white shoes? Because my hands aren't clean. She half smiled. When I see them, I think of her, and I don't feel like I never had a mother. I just see a woman with white gloves. That's... Really weird. I know. It's something no one knows about me but Orlando. But you asked. I cupped the side of her face. It is odd, but it makes sense to me. I didn't realize it was so deep. I wouldn't have asked. No, you would have most likely looked into it behind my back. She shook her head. I'd rather get all the skeletons out now while we're both civil and sexually satisfied. I smirked at that. I'm not sexually satisfied yet. She rolled her eyes at me. Relax, Tiger. Tell me about you. Grabbing the wine, I took a deep breath before knocking back a drink. She went deep into her past and shared something no one alive knew, with the exception now being me. She trusted me. I would have to trust her. I just didn't know how to start. You don't have to. I want to, Mel. I said softly. I want to, and I will. I haven't travelled this deep in me for a long time. Is it about your childhood? She asked, and I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was. I don't know anything other than you were sick once and tormented for it. I started slowly. I was born a twin. Evelyn was on her way to a fundraiser with my brother when one of Vance's people drove them off the road and into a tree. The driver was able to get Neil out, but Evelyn went into labour and couldn't move. When the paramedics came and got her, she was already pushing my sister out. But she never cried or even took a breath, and when they got to the hospital, I was stuck. They had to pull, and because of that, my shoulder was broken. My heart and lungs weren't fully developed yet, and I barely even cried. It was more like I was gasping for air. They didn't think I was going to make it, but I did. However, my growth, weight and speech were stunted, and on top of it, I was blessed with club feet. For some odd reason, even though I didn't remember it, I always felt a pain in my shoulder when I thought about it. Evelyn went into a deep depression, and as much as she loved me, she couldn't look at me without seeing her dead baby girl in her hands. So she stayed away. In all honesty, my earliest memory of her isn't until I was maybe twelve. It was my father who spent most of his time with me at the hospital. Over the years, he read articles from the paper and would tell me how important my future was while the doctors did tests and I went through treatment. I remember him losing his shit at doctors once. Or twice. All that reading and teaching he did stuck with me, though. By the time I could finally leave the hospital and go to school, I was well beyond any twelve-year-old. One moment I was at St. John's Hospital, the next I was at Northside College Preparatory High School with Neil, who had a reputation as a badass. I laughed at the memory. Students almost shit themselves when Neil was pissed at them. He was captain of the football team, a wrestler, and played hockey and every other sport that let him destroy guys for fun. So naturally I looked up to him. But in school, he stayed away from me. 
I, shaky legs and all, tried out for the football team only to have balls thrown at my back. The coach took pity on me and made me the water boy. One day some of Neil's friends pushed me down a flight of stairs before putting me in a locker with their dirty clothes. Neil didn't know I was there. He just walked in when his friends were pissing on my clothes and told them to chill out. That I was my father's favourite and he would have to deal with my mental shit later. I didn't say anything because I couldn't. I hadn't taken my medication that morning and ended up having a seizure in the fucking locker. I almost wanted to laugh because it was so fucked up. I was shaking so badly that the locker shook with me in it and the coach found me. I ended up in the hospital with my mom crying and praying over me. I had been in a coma for a week, and she promised God she would be a better mother if he just made me healthy. They ran tests, gave me drugs. Declan, who had spent most of his time to himself after his parents died, came to me and told me they burned down the house of the fucker who put me in the locker. Neil and I don't take trips down memory lane. I think I got better in spite of him. I had almost forgotten she was sitting across from me when she handed me the bottle of wine again. It wasn't better than brandy, but it was good enough. Okay, you win most depressing childhood. You should have cut his dick off and shoved it down his throat. I coughed as I took a drink before smiling at her. I was twelve. She shrugged. I don't give a fuck. Neil's dick and a fucker's dick or anyone else who was there would have to live with it. The assholes. She didn't know it. But for someone who didn't know how to love, she was sure doing a good job. Noted. She was the best thing in my life, and it only took three fucking days. She made me excited for the future. Now I don't feel bad for shooting Neil. She replied, falling back on the bed, and I allowed my eyes to wander up her legs, then her thighs and her stomach before reaching her breasts. Did you ever feel bad? I asked her, pushing the tray of wine and food off the bed and onto the floor. It shattered and I knew it would make a huge mess, but I didn't give a fuck. I just wanted my wife. She watched me as I rose above her. What were the files for? I'd forgotten all about them. Grabbing her back, I pulled her up against me. First pleasure, then work. I think it's the other way around, she replied, wrapping her legs around my waist. We make our own rules from now on, Mrs. Callahan. I kissed her forehead. Cupping her ass and thrusting into her tight pussy. Her lips went straight to my neck. Rule number one. After, or during our meetings and chats, we make sure to fuck each other's brains out. I slammed into her. Agreed. She gripped onto my shoulders and moaned. Agreed. She said before pushing me back and holding me there. Rule two. We never use a fucking condom. Agreed? She hested me, and I almost came. She was fucking perfect. Fuck yes. I flipped her over and pulled out of her, grabbing the lube on the bedside table, and squeezed a generous amount before burying myself in her tight ass. Rule three. I moaned loudly, unable to think when she raised onto her knees, pushing her ass against me, with her hands wrapped around my neck. Rule three. We trust no one but each other. She said to me, and I could no longer control my need. Grabbing onto her ass as I did her waist early in the evening, I slammed myself into her. Pushing her back down, I pulled on her hair as though it were reins. Agreed. Fuck, Liam! She moaned as she came, and when she did, I pulled out of her, allowing my seed to slip onto her back. It was sick how much I enjoyed it. She was mine. She was all fucking mine. Rising, she turned to me and slapped me in the face. Something I was starting to fucking enjoy, even as it burned. It was one of the many things that made Mel different. Now I have to take a shower. She hissed at me as she stood up, and I looked to her proud and in lust. She had found the monster inside me and fed it. Sadly, I didn't think I would ever have enough of her. She headed over to my bathroom, but stopped to look back at me. Are you tired already, Mr. Callahan? I still have more rules. She's fucking perfect. I almost groaned. We were going to break each other, and it only made me more excited. Jumping up, my cock standing alert and searing for her, I let her lead me into the waiting shower. She's fucking perfect.
Even as she pushed me down onto my knees and forced my face into her pussy, I would happily drink her in. Melody I said nothing, choosing one of his clean shirts to wear as he spoke with a dark-haired man at the door. Taking a seat on his bed, I watched him carefully as two maids ran in quickly to clean up the mess we had made with the wine and the food. Neither of them dared to look up. Instead, they worked as quickly as possible. I wasn't sure what was going on between Liam and me, but the untrusting part of my mind was telling me to put on the damn brakes. We had only known each other for three, now four days, seeing as how it was very early in the day. Neither of us was tired, which was odd, because we had done nothing but have mind-blowing sex for hours. The only time we had spoken was when we had confessed some of our darkest secrets. He put me on edge because he made me trust him. He told me the truth, and then stepped up to do the one thing I knew I did not have the strength to do. Orlando had wanted to make sure he died after my wedding because he didn't want me to feel alone. I tried to tell him I wasn't lonely, but he always told me the path of a boss was a dark and lonely one. I never had friends. I never socialized with anyone other than my men and the servants at our home. I always kept myself busy learning languages, studying and training. I never thought too much about it. Not until now. Not until Orlando, the only family I had ever had, had died. It hit me like a tsunami. I did not have anyone. And then there was Liam. For the first time I understood why Orlando had pushed me so hard into accepting him. Because even though I didn't trust Liam yet, the promise of future trust was there. He was now the only family I had, a fact that confused me. I felt like I could trust him. I wanted to trust him. I wanted to be what he needed, because now I needed somebody. I never realized how much Orlando filled that role for me. Over the last four years since I had become boss, he was the only person I vented to, the only person I used as a whiteboard for all my plans, telling him each and every step just because I needed to get it out of my head. I told him when I was stressed, when I just wanted to murder someone, and when I did murder someone. Orlando was my true right hand, and now Liam was taking his place. Not in a creepy Liam-is-my-daddy type of way, but more like Liam was now the only person I could freely speak with. Everyone else was under me. Everyone else I didn't respect. Orlando had been it. Now Liam was. You were right. Liam replied, his voice serious as he took a seat in front of me. The maids were gone. I hated that he was in his pajama bottoms. I missed staring at his ass. I know, I smirked. But about what? Rolling his eyes at me, he handed me the file before heading to his desk. He grabbed his brandy and poured us both a cup. Looking over the flight transcript, I grinned. Amory is on his way to Austria, I read aloud, taking the glass he offered. Yes, and I was thinking about using it as a cover. He frowned, drinking slowly. I waited for him to go on, but he didn't. Well, I asked, annoyed that I had to waste words. He eyed me carefully, as though I were a child before he spoke, and it pissed me off. Orlando didn't want the world knowing he was sick, and I was thinking of causing a fake accident and letting rumors spread that it was Amory. He stopped, and in my mind I thought it was perfect, but before I could say anything he misread my facial expression. I don't mean to use your father's death as a chess piece, nor do I want to— Liam, shut the hell up. I'm not a child whose feelings will get hurt. Yes, I care for Orlando, but he is dead. I knew it was coming for years. It sucks, but don't treat me as if I'm glass. My father would have loved to have been used to screw the Valero. So let's do what we do best. A game of chess. I was not going to be seen as emotional because my daddy was dead. Nor would I let Liam forget who I was, even though our relationship was changing. I was still a fucking boss, and I still had work to do. He raised an eyebrow at me before leaning back and smirking. Glass, you are not wife. Very well. We will allow Amory to think he killed Orlando. The bastard will be so full of himself that he'll take bigger risks, thinking he took out the great iron hands. When he goes to Morocco in the next couple of weeks, we will go to Italy and burn down some cars. Vance will be forced to react and bark orders at Amory, who will tell Ryan, and when we know, we will keep bleeding him dry. I replied, Death by a thousand cuts. And then cut off his head.
I said, raising my glass before knocking it back. He handed me another file, this one full of pictures of all his men. The first was of a hazel-eyed, dark-haired man in his early thirties. Patrick Dara is like my malware. He can make sure nothing that we don't want in the press gets in the press, and he can also get anything on air in seconds. The next is Dylan Carmack, he said as I looked at the green-eyed man. He's my weapons export. If you want it, he can get it, no matter what it is. I filed through all the photos quickly. You fucking Irish breed like rabbits. Speaking of, how many kids do you want? I glared at him, not sure if I should shoot him or not. You will find out when I'm okay with the idea of being barefoot and pregnant. Why do I have a feeling that isn't a measurable amount of time? How about we get to know each other, and in a few years we can discuss this topic again? I said. He grinned, the fucker. I knew he just couldn't wait until I was round and fat, unable to drink, and stuck in bed while he fucked over the world. Hell to the fucking no to that. Was that real far? I guess so.